Welcome to Daily Devotion with Ken Gurley. Devotions designed to inspire you on your daily walk with God. Here's your host, Ken Gurley. Well, it doesn't seem possible. Here we are at the end of another work week and um, just very thankful for a great week and for each and every one of you. Good to see all of you beautiful people. Yes, I, I don't care if you still have those pink fuzzy slippers on I it, it, and you're just wandering around the house running into walls and you're wondering what what are you doing this is a beautiful people bunch of folks I mean every time I look at you I mean I see these pictures obviously the pictures you want to see so obviously you're beautiful all the time so we're happy that you're here <laughs> it's good to see all of you I'm thankful for the great week what we've had this week. We are living the blessed life, the blessed life. We're going through 90 days, 90 days to change your world. And um, that book, KenGurley.com, PentecostalPublishing.com, and you can avail yourself of it. And we're having difficulty right now in the book because the way this my schedule shows, we're supposed to land on fasting during Thanksgiving week. So I'm just having to sort of pick around the edges here and stay not so much on target, but the Lord knows we're, we're going to get through there and uh, have a kind of a special treat the week after Thanksgiving. We're looking forward to that. I, um, I just want to say thank you for being a part of this. Onita, Patricia, thank you. Thank you, Tim. It's good to have you, each and every one of you, Debbie and you guys make doing life fun, getting up in the morning, saying hello to everybody, checking in, tagging in, praying for one another. And uh, what strikes me is, uh, about this Daily Devotion family um, is that quite often you'll start missing names out there, missing comments, and we start getting texts and emails. Have anybody seen so-and-so and so-and-so? You're missed when you're not on here. So thank you for being a part tagging in. Um, yesterday I was discussing uh, day 54 in the book, Our God's Consuming Fire. This morning I was ready to move forward and a previous day called out to me and said, you need to look at me. And I, I read day 48 again, come to the garden. And, and I don't know, I was impressed. I was just impressed. And to go back and read John 19 this morning, it's a beautiful verse of scripture that in the place where the Lord was crucified, there was a garden. What contrasts? Uh, Calvary's hill in a garden. And that just started me down a path that I couldn't get away from. And I landed at Calvary because indeed, indeed, the beginning of it all is Calvary. And that is the beginning of the plan of salvation uh, repentance, we die to our sins, the death, burial, the resurrection. It all starts there. That's the 180, the pivot, that I'm not going to be cursed, I'm going to be blessed. And so I just, it just hit me. I was going through John 19 and I came across another verse. To me, it's one of the most powerful verses and it's going to flow right over your uh, mind. Uh, John is the Holy Spirit has brought to John's memory a couple of Old Testament verses that no bones would be broken, just as prophesied. And then verse 37, it says, And again, another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. And uh, a second Old Testament prophecy, because the Lord's bones were not broken, and he was pierced in his side. And... Um, but the, that phrase, they shall look on him, and again another scripture saith. And that's how this title was born today, Look Again. Look again. Um, some things are worth a second look. Some things are worth stopping and just saying, I need to look again. I. It reminds me of two men um, that we knew it, and uh, we're in a church that when Tessie and I used to travel around we uh, worked at the district office would be out every weekend and 
we we would settle at this church many times and uh, two men two men were telling the story they had just come back from Colorado and gone snow skiing and uh, they've been skiing for a week and then never been uh, they drove to the ski resort put on their skis and took the first lift they saw and uh, got to the top of the hill and started skiing down and I mean they were telling us about this and how much they enjoyed the skiing and and um, they, they kept saying we conquered that hill there's not a square inch of that hill that we didn't ski and and uh, I had been Tessie and I had been to that ski resort and it's not um, one hill it's three mountains gigantic mountains you can ski on both sides of the mountains hundreds of ski runs and they kept saying we we conquered that hill we skied every square inch and finally someone who had also been to that place said no no wait a minute which which hill are you talking about they said the one that that hill right in front of and they named a lift and and it dawned on everybody that had been there before that they had gotten on the shortest lift that only went a few hundred yards what they call the bunny slopes is for brand new beginners of skiing they had skied an entire week on the bunny slope and thought they had conquered the mountains wow i i, I it, it just we got we we got tickled by it and uh, not in their presence but later we, we we got tickled by it because they had spent <clears throat> their time on the beginner's heel when you could have gone 6,000 feet higher to any one of the runs that would have taken you for miles down those ski slopes. But they felt like they'd seen it all. No need to go back to that resort, they said. We've seen it all. We've seen every square inch of that hill. You see, this is what sometimes I think we, we get blinded. We get blinders on our eyes and we don't see the fullness of what God has. When John said, and another scripture saith, by the way, that is one of the anchor verses of Bible interpretation, and another scripture saith. Don't look at one verse and say, I found it all, I understand it all. Look at the whole Bible, look at the totality. There's a law of unity. It's one of the eight basic rules of interpreting scripture that scripture doesn't contradict scripture, but scripture will interpret scripture and another scripture saith. Most false doctrines are formed by looking narrowly at one passage and not considering what God's word says in other places. We say, see, I found, I found justification for exactly what I want to do right here, this little verse of scripture, you know? I, I, I was, I, I'm not a good counselor. Shelly, Kirk, I'm a terrible counselor. Terrible, terrible. One of the worst you've ever seen. And because um, I'm a Mr. Fix It, you know, I want to fix things. And, and I, I don't, you know, it didn't dawn on me until late in life that a lot of people that go to counseling don't really want it fixed. They just want to talk. And um, so I'm just a terrible counselor. I, I am really a terrible counselor. So I don't give, I don't give people, um, much opportunity except praying with them, talking with them in the altars and everything to, to sit down because I, I, they're just not willing. They're, they're, they're not willing. Many people are just not willing to open up to the moving of the Spirit, the Word of God, and prayer. There, there. I've expressed my bias. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> but I'll never forget. I'll never forget back what I did counsel, and I thought I knew it all, um, that uh, two people came to me and um, and they had just met, and um, and they assured me they were getting married that day. They were going to the JP and getting married, and I I I still didn't know better, and and I I I I voiced my concern that they didn't know each other, and they looked at me appalled, and they said, "Have you not read that the Lord is going to do a quick work in the last days?" So there you go. You got one verse of scripture. And, uh, but I got other verses of scripture too. Look again. There are other verses of scripture out there. Okay, I'm in trouble. I am so much in trouble. I'm in trouble on daily devotion already. Oh, 
There's some things that it's just profitable to look a second time. And maybe the picture come, becomes clearer. And again, another scripture saith they will look on him. So look again. Can I give you three areas that are worth a second look? Three areas. Um, not Bitcoin. I, I'm, I'm not talking about Bitcoin. I'm not talking about the dinar. I'm not talking about uh, the, the latest pyramid scheme. This is worthy of a second look. The beauty of holiness is worth a second look. God is a God of beauty. And what he engineers, he does well. Anything which at first glance may appear distasteful. When you look at it again, there is a, there is a beauty in it all. Holiness is that way. I don't need to tell you the word holy is used to describe God more than any other adjective in Scripture. Um, the Lord swears, Isaiah 57 and 8, by his holiness. It's the Lord, it's his holiness that the Lord lays on the line as his permanent pledge. Power is God's hand and arm. Omniscience is his eye. Mercy is his inward parts. But holiness is his absolute stellar beauty. Holy was the adornment, the decoration, the beauty of the temple, Isaiah said. You remember, you remember the tabernacle, it was covered with badger skins. One translation says porpoise skins. From the outside, it wasn't too pretty, but the gold was on the inside. The priest's vestment and the jewels were on the inside. All of the glory was on the inside. It's that way with holiness. Don't, don't look at it from an outward carnal eye. There is beauty within. The angel found God, the angels found God's holiness beautiful because they can talk about little else around the throne of God shouting, holy, 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 holy. In Ezekiel's vision of God, heaven asked the question, who is like unto thee, Lord, that is beautiful, glorious, holiness? In Isaiah 6, when the seraphim praised God and the beauty of holiness, what happened? The posts in heaven moved and the house was filled with smoke. Holiness then is lovely to those who see God as he really is, and who worship God in the beauty of holiness. But if you don't see God as he really is, if you just pick up a random verse of scripture that shows the fierceness, but not the beauty of God, that shows the truth of God, but not the grace of God. Jesus Christ came full of grace and truth. He leads with grace. He leads with grace. There's something altogether lovely about the Lord. Take a moment and look again at holiness and don't say it's a drudgery. Uh, don't look at that verse of scripture that says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eye and wonder why should I do that? My eye affects my heart, another scripture says. That's why. And be not drunk with wine where it is excess. Why? Because there's another option. You can be filled with the Spirit. Look again. Look again at Scripture. Or what about that word modesty? I love the word modesty in the Greek. It's cosmos. Cosmos. Um, sort of sounds like cosmos. That there is a world of modesty and then there is the world. But cosmos means having parity. Being of the same mind. Having alignment. You're the same within, without. Yes, that's what we want. I, I don't want the holiness of the Pharisees. I don't want the self-righteousness and the self-judgment and, and um, all of that that comes with it. It may seem, holiness may seem restrictive, but look again. It's not a club to beat someone else over the head. It's a garment in resplendent white that's given in exchange for the tattered old garment of sin. Look again. Holiness isn't a self-righteous attitude that repels. It's a magnet that draws people. Holiness is an excuse. It isn't an excuse for us to say people don't want this message because they don't want to live this life. I believe there is a winsomeness. There is an attractiveness. There is a beauty of holiness that draws people into the presence of God. You, you just, when you look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, there was a holiness about him 
Wow. And be ye holy as I am holy, he says. There was a holiness. It didn't repel people. It drew sinners. It drew publicans. And uh, the Bible says gluttons and wine bibbers and uh, women of ill repute. There was a magnetism about him. There was something beautiful about Jesus. Oh, yes, I know Isaiah 53. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, smitten of God, stricken. There was no comeliness to his appearance. But oh, just hold on a moment. The beauty of holiness will shine through. God's holiness should attract everyone. No wonder Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. You need to look again. I saw the Lord. You need to look again at the holiness of God. Can I tell you there's another, two, two more things. I'm going to hit them real quick. Look again at prayer. To many, prayer is simply war. I'd make war on the floor. I do battle on my knees. To some, prayer is just a muzzle on their talkative conscience. I pray because if I feel bad if I don't pray. To some prayer is something to be endured like swallowing cod liver oil. <sighs> to some it's just a way of getting attention. It's a spiritual gold star on their chart. Like the Pharisee in the temple saying, praying, Lord, I just want to thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you that I'm a cut above everybody else in this house. Yeah, that's, that's some prayers, their spiritual pedigree. But to some more honest folks, prayer can seem to be a drudgery. It's hard to pray when things are going easy because you don't think you need to pray. It's hard to pray when things are going bad because it's too taxing. It's exhausting. It's easy to do for a few minutes after you, if you're convicted by a message preached. But then we must be convicted again to bring us back to that altar. You say, it's war, it's war. Well, that's one way to look at it. And there is a spiritual warfare aspect. But why don't you look again at prayer and realize prayer is not just ugly warfare. It is a beautiful relationship with God. There are some things about a dysfunctional family. It doesn't touch, it doesn't talk, and it doesn't trust. Dysfunctional families don't touch, talk, or trust. Prayer is touching heaven. Sure it is. Cornelius' prayers touched heaven. Prayer is talking with God. I come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the roses, he talks with me. He tells me. Do you remember when Abraham's servant prayed, saying, God, I need help picking the bride of Isaac. Let it be the one that offers me something to drink and my camels as well. You remember what he said in Genesis 24, 45? And before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebecca came forth. Do you know that God hears and talks while you're still forming that prayer in your heart? This isn't a dysfunctional family. No, this is the family of God. We touch, we talk, and we trust. Talk to him. Look again at prayer. It is beautiful. It can be beautiful in your life. Joe, Thomas, Linda, look again. I love the passage in Daniel 9. He's grieved. He sees that Israel is sinned. He goes to his chamber and cries out. Here's what the Bible says. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, he touched me about the time of the evening sacrifice. And he told me, and he talked with me, and said, Oh, Daniel, I'm now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Oh, that's beautiful. Look again at prayer. If hearing from God is good, listen up in prayer. If growing more like him is good, listen up in prayer. Prayer is trusting God. You've heard the daddy of sin is prayerlessness, the granddaddy of all sins, faithlessness. Faithlessness, because people who have no faith don't pray. But people who do have faith pray. Look again at prayer. 
One more. Holiness prayer. And I want you to look again at an awakening. At an awakening. Wow. Take a second look at how you envision everything ending up. We're talking about blessed. I I don't believe, yes, we know that the world will get ever worse. We know where this thing is ultimately headed. But I believe we're, we have a blessed hope, not a blasted curse. We have a blessed hope. And we need to speak to one another that these last days, we're not going out with a whimper. We're going to go out with joy. We're going to go out with power. We're going to go out with strength. Take a second look. Take a second look at everything. I hear people say, well, there's going to be a great falling away. I believe that. But I believe there's also going to be a great awakening. I believe that. I believe that we are going to see uh, a Laodicea, a falling away church, living side by side with the Philadelphia, a brotherly love, and an open door revival church. Why do I believe that? Because hope is the anchor of the soul, the Bible says. I've looked again at the last days, and I see the mind of God that his first miracle in Cana of Galilee, he saved the best for last. That simple principle, he saves the best for last. Wow. That the latter rain is going to be greater than the former rain. The latter house will be greater than the former house and the latter you will be greater than the former you. God's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. All flesh. Look again. Look again. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for this week. What a wonderful week. I did something the first time I've ever done it. I want to thank you for your response to it. I talked about going on KenGurley.com and just sponsoring to whatever extent you have. Your tithing belongs to your local church. Your missions giving your local church. Your sacrificial offerings your local church. But if you can spare something to help us, uh, I've been purchasing new lights and equipment, new microphones. They fail, and, uh, and we want to keep doing this for years to come if the Lord gives us the strength and grace. You can do that at KenGurley.com. And just say, donate now. It's the first button you see, Daily Devotion. And uh, thank you for that. Thank you for those. My administrative assistant tells me that so many of you have been on there. Thank you for that. And thank you for supporting this. Spread the word. Like and follow on Facebook. Subscribe on YouTube. Get the word out. You know why you need to get the word out? Because you are indeed... A beautiful bunch of people. You need to tell people, you may not think I'm beautiful, but I'm beautiful. That's right. That's right. I heard it on the grapevine of daily devotion. (laughs) I want you to go have an amazing weekend. I'm looking forward to speaking in Pearland this weekend. I'm just looking forward to the greatness of God and all that he has planned for each and every one of us. Go have an amazing Friday and see the Lord do great things in your life. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing in daily devotion with Ken Gurley. We pray this ministry has been a source of encouragement and strength to you. Please be mindful that your financial support enables us to meet with you each day. To give a donation or connect with us, visit our website at kengurley.com. There you will also find the latest books, podcasts, and resources. Blessed 90 Days to Change Your World is Pastor Gurley's latest book. You can get your copy of this life-changing book at KenGurley.com. May God's favor rest on you in every way until we meet again.